for everyone who's registered to load into the Zoom webinar. So if you'll just be patient with us, we'll get started momentarily. And Congresswoman, we cannot hear the leaf blow. <laughs> Good. If you're just joining us on Zoom, if you'll just be patient with us for just a moment, we're letting everyone load into the session and then we'll get started momentarily. Good afternoon from Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, DC. My name is Ken Levinson and I'm the executive director of WIDA. We, are, we hope you are all doing well and staying safe. Uh, pleased uh, to welcome all of you back for our third member interview in partnership with the American Leadership Initiative. Overall, this is our 14th free webinar we've hosted on trade since COVID-related shutdowns, and we're very happy to have become a central meeting place for the global trade community at this difficult time, both in the United States and around the world. We'll continue our weekly discussions tomorrow uh, talking about U.S.-U.K. trade with Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for North America, Anthony Philipson. He'll be joined by Laura Lane, the president of UPS Global Public Affairs, and Craig Beaumont from the UK Federation of Small Businesses. Note that if you're watching that tomorrow, it starts at 10 a.m., not our usual 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, after the discussion today with the Congresswoman, we'll try to take some questions from you in the audience. If you're watching this on Zoom, you have the ability to ask questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. But with over 250 people registered for the webinar, we're not able to have all of you live on audio and video, so we'll read those questions and try to get to as many of them as we can. You should have received an email from us earlier this afternoon with biographies for our speakers, so I won't do a lengthy introduction, but I would like to say a special welcome to our guests, Arit Frankel of the American Leadership Initiative and Congresswoman Suzanne Delbene. We're delighted to welcome the Congresswoman back to WIDA. She was the recipient of our Congressional Leadership Award in 2019, and we've had the pleasure of hosting her several times over the years at live events in Washington, DC. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us today, and we hope your family is doing well and staying safe. Thank you. Thank Everyone's you. doing well. Good to hear, good to hear. And uh, as mentioned after the panel's remarks and discussion amongst them, uh, we'll turn to questions. Ori? Thank you, Ken. Uh, and thank you to WIDA for your partnership in this event uh, with the American Leadership Initiative on American Leadership in Digital Trade. Uh, the American Leadership Initiative or ALI is creating a new vision and policy agenda for restoring American leadership uh, working with elected officials and their staff and a diverse group of thought leaders, including business and civil society. Um, you can learn more about us at our website, American-leadership.org. I wanted to thank Congresswoman Del Bene for taking time out of your, I know this is a very busy time to say the least, uh, to talk to us today. Congress, the Congresswoman has represented Washington State in Congress for the past eight years. And for the past three years, she's been on the Trade Subcommittee of House Ways and Means and has really, prior to joining Congress, she was with Microsoft. And she has quickly established herself as one of the more knowledgeable thought leaders in Congress regarding digital and technology issues. So we're delighted to have her for this discussion. So during, you know, digital is particularly relevant now as during the pandemic, you know, it seems like we're all learning and, and working online. So it's, it's brought many of these digital issues into much sharper focus. Um, the digital policy space still kind of remains an unregulated, unregulated wild west. Um, you know, and every country is kind of going down its own path. So I wanted to talk to you about um, steps that the US can take both domestically and internationally to really set the rules for the 21st century and really make sure that digital trade remains safe, secure and open for business. So let's start by looking at the domestic agenda. Um, I know last year you introduced legislation to create a national privacy standard um, in the meantime, California has introduced its own high level privacy standard, uh, you know, which has really gathered some pushback. So how do we get a consensus around getting a US privacy standard? Um, 
you know, which will really protect Americans, but also allow us to then engage in a discussion with, you know, our European and other counterparts who are setting their own standards. Um, so we can- oh, yes. Thank you and thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm gonna apologize for the leaf blower you might hear because I hear it lurking and coming closer in my way, but- um, uh, So far, so good. Good. Privacy is an uh, incredibly important issue and, um, and we need domestic policy. We need there to be a federal policy to address consumer data privacy. Um, as you mentioned, I introduced legislation um, to address this, HR 2013. Um, the, I think you know, we continue to have a challenge that technology and some of these issues are areas where we have to do a lot of education for lawmakers so they understand why this is so important and understand the types of policies, the issues that we need to address and how to address them. Um, this, the good news is it should be bipartisan. There really isn't a partisan divide here. I'd say it's more helping people understand that this is a huge priority. Um, and as you talked about, maybe because everyone is using technology so much more now, um, this will bring it more to the forefront. Um, but I think this is very urgent. We've had, um, I've introduced legislation around contact tracing and privacy of information with respect to um, the public health response, um, very, very critical information, but we really need that basic guideline and, and California's moved forward and I would expect that other states will move forward separately um, in the absence of federal legislation. And if we're going to be setting, helping to set global standards, which I think we should be playing that role, we need domestic policy or it's hard for us to know um, when we come to the table what we're talking about. So, um, we got to keep talking about it. We got to keep making this priority. I'm going to keep pushing. And I think we have an opportunity, but it's got to be a high enough priority on everyone's list for us to get this through. Good. Well, thank you for, for keeping up that fight. Um, so moving a little bit to the global front, I know that the WTO e-commerce talks have been moving forward, but you know it's, it's challenging because they've got uh, negotiating partners like China, India, and other other difficult uh, partners in the negotiation. So I think, you know, by definition, the negotiation is going to take a long time and probably the level of ambition will be relatively low. Um, meanwhile, you know, again, as you know, countries are putting in place their own restrictions around data storage, data flows, and even content. Um, so it seems more important than ever that the US take the lead in really developing high standard digital rules for the 21st century. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, ALI really believes that we should set a high standard, that we should negotiate a high standard digital agreement with a group of like-minded countries, you know, perhaps, you know, as a second tier from the WTO agreement or as a separate track, et cetera. Um, I guess I wanted to get your thoughts on that and really how can we move this agenda forward? Well, first of all, I agree. I'm, I'm supportive of the negotiations that are happening now, but um, I also have been concerned about having so many countries involved and lowering the standard. Um, Cause when we talk about issues like digital trade, we need to aim to have a, a high standard agreement um, and when we include a lot of countries and, uh, and including China, um, that can make that very, very hard to do in the short term in particular, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, clearly uh, coronavirus has um, uh, around the world has slowed down conversations and negotiations. Um, and so it's a really good opportunity for us to bring a group of like-minded countries together um, to talk about what high standard digital agreement needs to be. Um, clearly we have USMCA as a model in place. Um, and once we have that agreement in place, we can talk about expanding that to other countries who wanna sign up for those standards. Mm -hmm. um, for developing countries, we can do things like um, providing technical and financial assistance to help them raise standards. But I do think it's very important that we have a high standard agreement and 
Um, and just like I said on privacy, that we are helping, helping lead the way for those global standards. Thank you, yeah. Um, so on that same vein, you know, China is moving quickly to, uh, you know, they are subsidizing their sale of digital equipment really throughout the developing world, but particularly Africa. And, you know, when they sell equipment, they sell their own regulatory um, environment, um, you know, which includes censorship, monitoring, you know, sometimes access to, you know, CCTV being the only news available um, and things like that. And, uh, you know, it really creates, a, a, I think, a risk to American security and democracy. Um, so, you know, we've educated advocated the notion of a digital Marshall Plan, the fact that the U.S. should allocate funds to really support the sale of U.S. equipment, um, and then, you know, our regulatory framework. Um, can you talk about whether, you know, we have the capability to support uh, U.S. exports in that way, the desire, you know, how can we really uh, mobilize in that direction? Um, thanks. It's a great question. And um, I think it's very clear that China is not going to fundamentally change its systems, its state-owned uh, um, enterprise system soon. Um, and I think your point is very well taken that our concerns aren't just about safeguarding um, technology um, that from China from a, a military standpoint, um, it's this is also a human rights issue. And um, so we have to make sure that technology um, isn't being used. Um, we know, we see what's happening in Hong Kong or with the Uyghur population. Um, I think we have, you know, it, it's important that we look at technology and how technology is used in both, both ways that we are holding high standards there. So, um, we have to develop our own capacity and our supply chains so that we aren't just reliant on, on China for everything. And I think that came up even um, if you look at the pandemic, I think we saw not necessarily in all the technology areas, but definitely across the board, supply chain challenges when things were so concentrated. Um, we need deep economic ties to, um, to a broad region um, so that we can um, make sure that we have high standards and um, on issues around things like artificial intelligence and privacy, but also on supply chain and making sure um, there are alternative resources available. Because as you said, um, in some cases, uh, you know, you look at 5G, folks have also felt like they haven't had other options um, of right. technologies to use. So, um, so there's a supply chain issue, to your point. There is a, a standards issue. There is a human rights issue. Um, and, uh, um, and so clearly we have, uh, these are, this is an important region. We will continue to have uh, a relationship with China um, but, uh, and need to work with them on things like global health and climate. Um, but when we look at technology, we have to be very thoughtful about um, how that's being used and the kind of underlying motivations that might um, impact things like security and, um, and human rights. Thanks. That's actually a perfect lead into my next question, which is, you know, I know that uh, there's been a lot of effort to um, uh, put in um, export controls and measures to safeguard our technology from Chinese companies and to um, put restrictions around what Chinese companies can sell in the US uh, into our networks, et cetera. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we also need to collaborate with China um, in this sector. And I know that uh, many companies really rely on sales to China. Um, and, and, you know, China has a lot of cutting edge research as well. How do we, how do we navigate that, uh, you know, managing our security while understanding that we really can't fully decouple and we need to um, have a relationship with them around technology? 
Well, I think you know these are challenging issues. There's not the yes. one answer, but um, but I would say first um, one we need to have to make sure we're setting standards. Um, we look at privacy, but also look at um, use of facial recognition, um, AI more broadly. How are we looking um, even domestically about setting standards and how those technologies are used? Um, and, um, and what types of requirements we might think um, need to be present to um, help protect information. Um, the, we have to, if we have our expected, you know, kind of hold those standards internationally, we have to understand what they are. And this is hard. This is not a one shot, you do it and it's done. This is going to be, um, co technology continues to evolve. I'd say we're behind, we're behind in a lot of areas as you brought up at the beginning in terms of putting policies in place to address um, technology. But, um, but we need to make sure we have thoughtful policy in place, um, make sure that we pass those policies here domestically and then work collaboratively in a multilateral way to make sure those become the global standards. In the absence of doing something, that's when I think we see um, others like China who might lead in what those standards might be. Um, and, in do, and also in implementing their technologies in other places that also um, might restrict opportunities for people to have the choice um, at, as you brought up earlier. So, um, so we need to engage, but we also have to engage in terms of what we think, how we address these policies um, domestically. And that's why I think um, Congress needs to act in terms of putting responsible policies in place to move us forward. Thank you. So on that same vein of, of uh, uh, co congressional action, um, so you know, given the value, inherent value in digital commerce, as you know, many countries are looking to tax that value. And the OECD is, is, is launching an investigation to address uh, the desire of, you know, to try to reach consensus around taxing digital activities. But in the meantime, you know, countries, um, including many in the EU, are imposing their own taxes, um, as well as, you know, many countries around the globe. And the, the U.S. is really um, negotiating one-on-one -on -one with countries. Um, is there a better way to handle the situation? Um, and, and what can we do more broadly to sort of avoid what is, you know, uh, an evolving kind of tax spaghetti bowl for many countries, mm -hmm. uh, companies, sorry. Yep. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the area of um, taxation um, has been impacted a lot by, uh, by kind of digital, digital technologies and, um, and digital goods. Uh, we haven't really even fundamentally thought about tax policy from a digital perspective. You probably saw the um, and, and knew about all of the challenges we had when we were looking at um, sales taxes in the U.S. and um, destinations changing. That was really more just based on e-commerce, and that was a, a big change in terms of how people looked at um, taxation because really most of our policies internationally are based on physical goods. Um, and um, and kind of this idea that you might physically go to one place to pick something up, um, and so that point um, of of the transaction taking place is important. Um, we have a digital world now, and we have to think through these policies across the board. And so I'd say, in terms of tax policy, this is another challenge. Um, and uh, and I don't think unilateral discriminatory. Um, digital taxes are helpful. I think they're counterproductive. I think that um, we need to have a, a policy in place that addresses this issue broadly, which is really what um, the OECD process is about when we're talking about um, DST and what's happening um, right now in Europe. Um, doing Addressing individual um, digital taxes through 301 investigations also isn't very efficient, um, but there hasn't been much choice in the sense that the OECD process really is the process that I think everyone's relying on to address these issues more broadly. So, um, and I understand that folks want to realize that revenue right away. 
Um, but to really resolve this in a way that makes sense going forward, understanding, I think the other thing that's important for folks to remember is that we talk about um, DST as if it only impacts certain technology companies, but pretty much you know, every type of industry has been impacted by technology. When you look at these issues, they're much more broad than any one sector of our economy. And that's why this process I think is so critically important um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page and foundationally we're looking at these issues. Um, so uh, I, you know, uh, definitely the status quo is not um, a long-term solution because we have not address these issues I talked about, about how digital um, digital goods and um, digital technologies have impacted um, the way things work in, in our world. But, um, but we need to do this in a way that's non-discriminatory, predictable, transparent, and that we can really build on going forward. So um, I think the process that folks are focused on now is OECD process. It's hard if that's the process if folks are undermining that um, by putting taxes in place before we've come to uh, agreement there. What do you see as the time frame for that process? Well, I think um, you know it's one of those things where you wish we were further along than we are. And I know um, clearly the pandemic has has. Um, has definitely impacted timelines and um, some of that has moved out, but I know they're continuing to try to get resolution. And, and so hopefully this calendar year, we'll hear something back from OECD. Great. So um, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, the USMCA has, I think at, uh, at this point, probably the highest uh, level digital uh, language in a, in a trade in any trade agreement. Um, are we looking and are we looking at using that same language with the UK? Are you thinking? Are we thinking about it for for Kenya? Uh, obviously, their economy is at a different state. How would we move forward to really um, expand that language into uh, agreements with other countries and more broadly? Well, I think I definitely would talk about the UK. It's pretty straightforward language. Um, um, I think the challenge right now, which isn't um, as impacted by the UK or, um, or Kenya in particular, is uh, our own discussions around Section 230. And even before the president's executive order, um, there were definitely conversations on USMCA about um, folks wanting to um, see Section 230 language removed from um, USMCA. So uh, I think that's going to be the bait. Uh, again, that is current US policy. And the, the, the language is based on current US policy. And so it's not we're not going to address this through trade agreements. This is a place where we have to figure out um, domestically if we're going to make changes and then address that. So I do think that. Um, the language that we have right now is uh, is strong trade language that um, digital trade language, and that really is the the template moving forward. But the issue might be more of a, a U.S. issue in terms of um, discussions and what discussions, how things move forward with respect to Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Uh, I noticed that we actually have a couple questions on uh, Section Two Hundred and Thirty. Uh, in the uh, lining up. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Ken uh, and see if we can, uh, we have, we have uh, quite a few audience questions piling up, so. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Orit. And uh, I think the, the Congresswoman is actually already uh, self-initiated uh, an answer to the <laughs> Section 230 question. Um, uh, we do have a few questions that have come in from our audience, um, I guess, uh, there's a hearing next week with uh, Ambassador Lighthizer. Uh, just wondering what are some of your expectations for that hearing next week? Um, so yes, there is, um, and it will be a, a, a virtual hearing. So um, the, of the full committee. Um, and so there are a lot of topics I think that will be addressed in terms of um, implementation issues around USMCA that folks wanna talk about and hear feedback on um, 
clearly uh, the, the current status with China, um, current status with other agreements that um, the ambassador is focused on. You brought up the UK and Kenya, any, anything else? Um, so I think we will cover a broad range of issues because we haven't met with the ambassador in a while and it will be unclear when we'll meet with him again. Mm -hmm. So um, I expect we will probably cover all of these topics in some way, shape or form um, when we speak with them. So I wanna ask you a mechanics question if I could. This is a question for me as somebody who's hosted 14 Zoom webinars over the past <laughs> few months. How are you doing? What is the technology? I mean, not, is it Zoom? Is it you're using a, a secure link? Is it something that the public can tap watch as well? Like how is how are you functionally going to hold the hearing next week? Yeah, so they, um, I believe it's all on, um, this will be on WebEx um, as the platform, but they have it set up so that um, folks can watch. It's also um, put on kind of our C-SPAN channels. Um, so if you're in the Capitol and other places, you would see the hearing on TV like you normally would. Um, it is a little bit different in the sense that you see the person speaking um, on the screen, but then you don't necessarily see everyone else. You see that shift, um, but you won't have kind of that view of the dais, et cetera, that you um, otherwise would. Um, so, uh, so you'll see whoever's speaking at it. At They're not going to prop cutouts of you guys at your seats <laughs> in the committee hearing room? I think that we can see everybody else and who else is there okay. in terms of all of the um, all of the other members um, and the uh, and the witnesses who are there, but um, um, but on the TV feed, I think all you yeah. see is the person who's speaking at a given time. So we've we've um, we did one um, a couple weeks ago on um, disparities um, the the disparities on uh, communities of color that exist mm -hmm. with. Um, the coronavirus and the impact that's had on our communities. And um, so we have had a hearing um, this way before. So um, folks are more familiar gotcha. with how it works. Good. Um, so another question that came in sort of uh, from, bears some resemblance, it flows naturally from the previous question about the hearing with Ambassador Lighthizer. Um, there's an election coming up in five months. Um, what if you uh, had a chance to advise uh, the vi uh, Vice President Biden if he's president, uh, what would you want to see from a trade agenda from the United States if uh, Joe Biden is elected president? Um, well, um, certainly these are just incredibly important issues, everything we've talked about, right? Making sure that, I, but I'd say the first thing would be to make sure you engage Congress. Um, a lot of the recent um, work from USTR has been kind of on their own and we've been more in the dark. So USMCA was a was through trade promotion authority, was through Congress and consultation with Congress. But a lot of these other deals, these smaller deals or phase one type deals um, have not been in consult consultation with Congress. And I think that we ended up with a much better deal in USMCA um, as a result of all of that input. And I think mm -hmm. that that has to be the way that we move forward. Um, it's very disappointing when we aren't able to kind of have that input um, and engage and talk about the things we're hearing in our communities. And definitely in a district like mine, um, where here in Washington state, we're the most trade dependent state in the country. These are hugely important issues and to make sure that you have input is critical. Um, and, and these piecemeal, um, Deals mean that you don't necessarily have all the things to bring to the table to um, to, to make sure you're you're um, kind of getting the best deal possible across the board. And so I that's another area. But clearly, we've got to address a lot of issues, and and uh, and these digital issues are also going to be important. But I'd say consult with Congress. There's a, we it. we set it up this way um, for a reason. And you do have a, a TPA renewal yes. coming as yes. well. And certainly that will be uh, impacted with your own, the committee's views on its consultation role in uh, consulting. Um, so a couple of questions, um, digging a little deeper, you brought up the US-UK negotiations. 
Um, and I mentioned that WIDA tomorrow morning is actually hosting a discussion on specifically on US UK. So I might even get to ask these questions again tomorrow. But um, uh, the how is the UK digital tax? Uh, what are you that, that, that's something that they've gone they're going forward with? Um, how do you see that impacting US UK negotiations? Well, I think this is discriminatory policy, as I said before, and um, and I've in, ex, expressed that um, when I've talked to um, um, uh, representatives from um, the UK too, because we have a process, the OECD process. Um, we are, everyone's engagement in that process I think is critical. And if we're going to come up with something moving forward um, that everyone can understand and frankly that um, you know, even smaller businesses and others kind of know how this will work going forward. It's going to be important that we do have a consistent long-term view of how we're moving forward when we look at um, um, digital types of taxes. And so it's one thing if conversations weren't happening um, ever and we had to, um, and, and with this conversation we're starting right now, we are in the middle of the conversation. This is why um, this has moved forward in this way. So um, preemptively uh, moving forward, I think, especially in a way where I would argue that it's really about targeting, um, targeting particular um, companies, US companies versus thinking about what foundationally should we do? Because um, I agree, we need to do something. Um, but, uh, but I think we have to think about this comprehensively and also realize, again, that, that it's not specific to any one industry, really, because these issues um, um, are issues that we see in many different sectors. You know, just thinking of it, I hadn't thought of it until we just started talking about it now. But you know, I don't know how, we as a nonprofit, we've made our content free on these webinars. Um, we're in the future going to try to do some training and more education using our platform. And there may be a, we may charge for future webinars. Maybe that's now, I don't know if that would be covered by a digital tax. I hadn't thought about it. We're a 501c3 and a c6. So we're nonprofit, but I, you know, it, we're all moving to more of a digital way of doing business and to suddenly now add an extra layer of cost onto something that's become a necessity and a new way of interacting with people. Um, and the people are, are used to having free. Right. Well, and and the the idea that we still have, like I said, a tax system that's really was founded on this idea of, of physical goods, physical presence, um, that when we rethink this, it has a lot of impacts and we should rethink it. I, you know, I feel like this is another place where we, I, when we were talking about the sales tax issues here domestically, this was something we needed to be talking about a long time ago. And we struggled with that um, right. here um, and the courts really had to come in. So from a policy standpoint, we have to start addressing these issues and they're hard and they're complicated, but um, that's a, the OECD, process is important to that because as you said this is going to you want something foundational that will um, help us and give people visibility going forward so um, another question about us uk getting away from digital tax um, if the uk stays aligned with eu gdpr regarding data protection and privacy do you expect that to uh, impact us uk negotiations and maybe have to have a separate agreement like a privacy shield to cover cross-border data flows? Um, so it's a good question. Um, and uh, um, I think that, um, you know, we, the one thing is that, you know, UK really has already been um, a part of the GDPR process. And so there's not a, a big change in terms of what they might be doing. So I think we're, we'd be able to address this um, between the US and the UK and, um, but I do think that we have to move forward in terms of privacy policy because this is really important. GDPR um, is becoming an international standard. It is, I mean, by definition, but, it, uh, but this is an area where it's very important that we bring uh, our view in terms of what consumer protections look like um, and, and how those need to be addressed. And we have to pass policy there if we're really going to be engaged. Otherwise, um, we are kind of uh, followers on when it comes to privacy. And 
as we also were talking about a little earlier, I think of I, my focus on privacy has been very focused just on consumer data privacy because I think it's foundational as we build out and start to look at all these other issues as the EU is also looking at things like you know, broad issues, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, what these mean. If we can't kind of come to that fundal agreement on privacy, then um, we'll, we'll struggle going forward. And it can't be 50 different state laws. Um, I think we need, a, I think we need a federal law. So, um, and that's part of what um, my legislation would do so that we have a consistent standard and that helps us as we're having um, conversations internationally too. So speaking of the international, the question comes in about building off the digital chapter provisions in USMCA and that we might want to seek some of those in future trade agreements, notwithstanding debates about things like Section 330 that might be happening domestically. Um, should we be seeking to amend existing FDA, FTAs with our, uh, we have, a, I guess, 18 other existing FTA partners? Should we be going back and adding digital chapters to some of those existing agreements? Well, I think um, I think going forward, we need to make sure we're addressing those digital agreements. So um, the question is, how do you do that? Do you go do that? Are there other issues that need to be addressed? Um, so I guess you kind of take that on a case by case basis. But yes, we need to have uh, digital chapters in our agreements, and it's actually pretty surprising if you think about it. You know, I would remind folks that when we were doing um, the U.S. MCA discussions that um, should USMCA go through, it'd be the first time that we were actually a party on a digital agreement. Um, we talked about it a lot in areas like um, TPP, but right. um, but it seems uh, it seems like if you, if you think about where we are in the state of technology, that this would have been something that was much more um, broadly implemented than it has been. So yeah. another question comes in from a good friend of WIDA, Ron Lorenzen. Um, he's asking about uh, potential infrastructure legislation. Obviously, with Congress um, working the way it is right now remotely an election year, the chance of maybe big infrastructure legislation may be difficult. But how do you see digital playing into some future infrastructure uh, uh, legislation in the United States? Um, that's also a great question. I. Um... I have been doing a lot of work on kind of what we talk about as smart cities and smart communities. And we look at infrastructure, um, uh, you know, we wanna make sure that the investments we make are in an infrastructure that serves us going forward, not in yesterday's infrastructure. Um, so clearly some of the most basic elements and things that have been extremely um, um, highlighted by the pandemic are just basic technology infrastructure like broadband. Um, the fact that I represent one of the biggest technology um, hubs on the globe, um, but I could go an hour from where I'm sitting right now to another part of my district where folks don't have rural broadband and don't have um, even reliable cell service really highlights kind of the most basic element of what we need when we talk about infrastructure and technology, because we can do this meeting, but we have folks who, um, can't participate or students who um, as school has gone to online can't participate. So I'd say fundamentally when we talk about technology, it's about just having that basic infrastructure in place. And it's pretty um, telling about how behind we are that we have not addressed it, this issue a long time ago. Um, but then there's, you know, how do we build infrastructure going forward, knowing what we know to make sure that it is going to um, serve us well. Um, and so when we look at smart cities, smart communities, it's about how do we use technologies to um, help our traffic move more efficiently and what should we uh, build in and how should we put those requirements in place? What can we do to address issues of climate and um, green renewable resources? So uh, those are all pieces of the conversation we're having on the, the infrastructure bill right now. Um, They've even been meeting this week on that. And yes, these are, um, it sounds hard because it's, there's a lot of work here in terms of getting something passed, but it also is, you, I don't think infrastructure is something that ever has been partisan. When you hear, I think you'd hear anybody um, who's a member of Congress talk about the need for us to have investments in infrastructure. 
So um, usually where we've struggled more is how you pay for it. Because also when you talked about digital um, taxes, we also just, we separately have a challenge where we have um, gas taxes, which don't kind of provide the return that they used to. And that's how we, you know, a lot of infrastructure was paid that way. And they don't provide the return kind of by design, right? We've had more efficiencies, other types of uh, alternative fuel vehicles. So we have to, step up and think going forward how we're going to make these investments um, in a new way so that you have those uh, those dollars to help us keep up from an infrastructure standpoint. So uh, I, can I just wanted to chime in for one second. Um, uh, I've done uh, also some writing you know around you know and I think the, the moment that we're in is really highlighted just to your point the real inequality, digital inequality in the United States. Uh, both rural and urban, but also income wise, yes. you know, with low income uh, families not having access to broadband, kids not being able to do their work, um, et cetera. And the fact that the US ranks so low compared to Korea and Japan in terms of internet accessibility, speed, et cetera. Um, well, we've even you know, talked about just having that big basic mapping done so you know where there's connectivity and where there's not and what type of access is there because even, you know, you want something that's truly usable, not uh, some type of connectivity that doesn't really give people enough um, throughput that they can actually accomplish the things they need to. And especially when we're using um, higher bandwidth types of technologies like we are right this moment, um, it's even harder and more, um, and makes it even harder for those communities, even if they have some level of connectivity. Mm -hmm. So you're right; it's an economic issue, it's a it's a access um, issue in some of our rural areas, and we just need to literally get that map, lay it out, and be able to talk about how we're making progress. And um, one of the other things on infrastructure we've talked about is just making sure where every time we're repairing a road or, or there's work happening that um, folks are also putting, um, play, taking into account the need for infrastructure so that, uh, or need for technology infrastructure so that you dig once, right? And you can put something in place, even if it right. doesn't connect point. everything, at least you get, um, um, get either fiber laid down or something there that can be connected to going forward as opposed to having these all be separable efforts. I will say on behalf of WIDA, with our series, we've had um, viewers in 36 states and 74 countries. So we have we certainly are supporters of a strong infrastructure here. I have one, uh, we're getting close to the end of our, our time. Um, I have one, a couple kind of specific tradey questions that are a little bit different than the ones we've been asking. Um, a little getting away from digital briefly, but um, the committee, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, this comes from Stephanie Lester. Uh, the committee has requested and received an ITC study on tariffs impacting COVID products, including PPE. Uh, many COVID products relate products uh, needed to combat COVID or keep people safe have tariffs, including a 7% MFN tariff on masks. Uh, do you see the committee taking any actions to eliminate tariffs on PPE? And is there any consideration of having tariff solutions maybe even be part of COVID-4 legislation? Um, that's a great question. And um, clearly we've, this has come up in a few ways um, with respect to PPE, but other types of, you know, medical devices and other things that have been critical for uh, COVID response, um, both in terms of making sure we address issues of tariff and then kind of basic supply chain, but even um, looking at, um, regulations that China was putting in place that made it harder for folks to export U.S. companies who are building things in China, harder for them to um, export those goods um, back to the United States. So yes, we need to comprehensively look at this um, and, um, and address these issues because we have a shortage uh, across the country still on personal protective equipment. It's pretty astounding with all this time in terms of being, and we haven't really had, I don't think, a coordinated federal response. Um, it's also true of testing supplies, things like swabs, et cetera, where we have had kind of 
fits and starts of availability. So these are critical issues that need to be addressed there. You know, sometimes they're um, the final products, sometimes it's supply chain issues so that we can get um, the products we need uh, across the board. So we need to look at that comprehensively and, um, and it may come up, I, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if many of these issues also um, come up in the hearing next week. And uh, we're gonna wrap up momentarily, but I do wanna, um, you mentioned about your district uh, being both a mix of, of urban and highly connected and rural. And we had a, a question come in, uh, first a compliment from Jaime Castaneda, thanking you for your help on agriculture and dairy, but how have those sectors been impacted by the change in trade flows? Uh, supply chains are very disrupted right now. There's container ships that don't have product uh, to take one direction or the other. So I know it's caused a bottleneck. There's been a lot of news about what's happened within the pork sector um, and some of those beef. I know those may not be your area, but certainly are agriculture and dairy interests in your district. Um, thoughts on, on the recovery in those areas and the impact that, that we've had so far? Um, well, um, it's a great question. I'm co-chair of the Digital Trade Caucus and the Dairy Caucus um, and the Aluminum Caucus, um, which kind of highlights a lot of the diversity of my district. Um, when we talk about dairy, uh, the, I think we saw a lot of folks um, across the country hit hard because of the change from you know, selling to commercial um, commercial customers to trying to figure out how to repackage and get um, things on the on the shelves, and that was a huge issue. Um, clearly, in our area, USMCA has been very important, given um, issue dairy issues, um, and uh, uh, between the U.S. and Canada, um, we have a lot of exports of uh, pow milk powder from my region, a big dryer um, for for the co-op here in, um, in my region. And a lot of that is exported to Asia. So um, it's extremely trade dependent. And so the supply chain issues have had an impact. The um, understanding whether kind of deals, the agreement with China, et cetera, how those move forward, um, that kind of uncertainty there has had an impact. But clearly ag has also was one of the ones hardest hit when we had, um, 232 tariffs going into place. Yes. And I wanted to mention, um, you know, we have one of the few aluminum smelters um, left in our country is in my district and they are now curtailing. That's 700 jobs we losing mm -hmm. up here in the Northern part of my district. And a lot of that is also a result of Chinese oversupply but not a coordinated multilateral response um, from the administration, which I think has been a a terrible missed opportunity and is impacting um, production right here and a lot of jobs um, in our region um, being lost during a pandemic, which is the worst time possible. So it's, it, it hits us in a lot of different ways. Um, and uh, ag definitely has struggled originally with those um, retaliatory tariffs and now, uh, you know, has to adapt to this, to the changes both domestically and internationally. So unfortunately for uh, we, uh, Congresswoman, I think you may have set a record for the number of questions that have come in. We had 19 questions come in. We got through 11 of them. I, <laughs> I need to apologize to those of you who we didn't get to, tried to hit as many of the different topics as we could. Very sorry to those of you we couldn't get to the questions on, um, but we, we are at the end of our time. Um, Ori, Congresswoman, any final words before we close off the broadcast? Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to the Congresswoman, and uh, I really hope that, um, you know, maybe in the next Congress, uh, with your leadership, we're, we're able to start passing some of the legislation that you've been championing, and, and that the U.S. is really able to move its agenda forward. Thank you, um, and uh, thanks, Arid and Ken. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity from um, for from my beautiful Washington out here, it's always confusing for folks when we talk about um, WIDA because in my world, they think we're talking about Washington State. But uh, um, these are important issues and this is an ongoing, clearly these are important ongoing conversations and I expect things will change a, a lot even in the short term. So look forward to continuing to working with all of you and uh, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, thank you. And Thank you. Just you so too. you know, we have a great partnership with WISIT, the Washington 
Council for, I think Council for International Trade and their people are terrific. And uh, WIDA uh, loves to partner with groups like that around the country, Washington DC and Washington state and <laughs> elsewhere. So okay. thanks to all of you. Thank you, Congresswoman, once again, for joining us at WIDA. Uh, look forward to seeing you in person, we hope again soon. Thank you, Ori, for bringing uh, uh, ALI to WIDA to do the, these member events. And we're really grateful to all of you. Stay safe, everybody, be healthy. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.